Hey Greyhounds, welcome to episode 12 of our NTI book chats. Today we are learning about J. Bruce Ismay um, from the book How They Choked. Um, and the title of this chapter is First Class Coward. If J. Bruce Ismay had a heart anywhere near as big as his ship, he would have been going someplace. Instead, his life was a series of titanic hit and run disasters, only they weren't all accidents. They were the handiwork of a man with ice in his veins, and the proof is the over 1,500 bodies that are at the bottom of the North Atlantic. Bruce Ismay should have gone down with his ship, the Titanic, when it sank, except he slithered into a spot on a lifeboat, claiming that there were no more women and children around to take his seat. That's how things go when you consider everyone but yourself worthless. Look out, Ismay ahead. J. Bruce Ismay was born in Liverpool, England in 1862, the second of nine kids, sibling number one, Bruce's older sister, and sibling number three, younger brother, both died, making Bruce the middle child of two dead ones. The family was getting smaller, but his mother kept at it, cranking out six more, including two sets of twins. It was like Noah's Ark at the Ismay household. Meanwhile, Bruce's father was making his own arcs, building and managing a massive fleet of ships called the White Star Line. But no matter how many ships or how many kids the family had, there was no love floating around. The four daughters weren't even allowed to speak during meals or to read the newspaper. Daddy Ismay was a militant brute to everyone, and Mom didn't stand up for her kids. She acted like lack of empathy was a virtue. Mr. Ismay didn't like being in the house at the same time as Bruce. He hated that one day his eldest son, Bruce, would inherit the White Star Line, which his hard work had built from the ground up. His son hadn't had to work for it. Still, he expected that Bruce would follow in his footsteps, like father, like son. When Bruce was 10, the White Star Liner Atlantic sank to the bottom of the ocean. It was the worst non-military sea disaster ever in the North Atlantic. One of the 900 people on board, over 500, out of the 900 people on board, over 500 drowned. What few lifeboats there were floated away empty. The story made the front pages of every newspaper in the world in 1873. This was when Bruce fell in love with scrapbooking the history of his family's ships. He cut out every article he could find and glued them into scrapbooks. Even though his feet were still growing, Bruce followed in his dad's footsteps, drowning people, and he would outdo him by about a thousand people. Bruce couldn't get his cold-hearted dad to love him, so he did the next best thing. He just became just like him. At 11, Bruce was sent to a rich boys boarding school. Bruce wasn't like the other boys there. Even though Bruce's family had 22 servants, they weren't like real rich people who inherited their money. The Ismays had worked for their money. There were lots of other boys Bruce didn't fit in, other ways Bruce didn't fit in as well. The other kids were having fun while Bruce was a brooding loner. His sense of humor entailed sarcastic remarks that bordered on cruel. He was athletic and tall, six foot four, but he never joined a team or made any friends. After finishing school, Bruce went to work for his dad. Mr. Ismay referred to Bruce as the new office boy, not as his son. Ismay Sr. didn't like it that Bruce made every decision as if he had a gun to his head and that he didn't work well with others. It got to the point where Bruce's dad didn't want Bruce around, so he sent him on a slow boat to New Zealand to learn about ships. Nine months later, Bruce Ismay was working in the New York branch of his father's business. Bruce was happy being 3,300 miles away from his dad. He, he even fell in love and got married to Florence Shiflin. Then it was time for Bruce to return to England and become a full-time partner in the business, but he didn't want to work in the same office as his dad. After turning down his dad twice, Bruce finally relented. Ignoring his stay-away-from-dad instincts, he headed back to England with his wife and two small children. On the trip back across the Atlantic, his youngest, six-month-old, old Henry became ill and died soon after they got to London.
That was the beginning of the end of Bruce's happiness, even though he and Florence had more kids. When his wife went into labor with their fifth child on a visit to his mother's house, Bruce's mother kicked Florence out because she didn't want a big mess in her house. The baby was born dead on the horse and carriage ride home. As if things weren't sad enough, their young son Thomas contracted polio and had trouble walking. Bruce despised anyone with a handicap, even his own son. Ismay sometimes made Thomas the brunt of his jokes, but most of the time he didn't speak to him at all. Ismay decided he didn't like any of his kids and built a separate wing in his house so he wouldn't have to see them or talk to them. Sound familiar? Ismay even bullied his wife, whom he had once loved. When Ismay wasn't working, the only things he liked to do were hunting and scrapbooking newspaper articles about himself and his ships. After his dad died, Bruce Ismay really wanted to make some headlines of his own. So he planned on building the largest moving man-made objects on the planet. That would be something to scrapbook about. Ismay built Titanic and Olympic, identical twin ships. At this point, trips across the Atlantic Ocean were no longer dreaded. No more weevil-infested hardtack biscuits or sleeping in bunks ate to a room. Even his Titanic third-class accommodations weren't too bad, although third-class was on a separate and secure deck of the ship so Ismay and the other rich people wouldn't have to look at the poor people. First-class was luxurious, with gourmet food, concerts, and dress-up balls. Ismay's favorite captain, Captain Smith, was nicknamed the Millionaire's Captain because he was so skilled at sucking up to wealthy clients. At 49 years old, Ismay was as disliked and alone as he had been at boarding school, and Captain Smith covered for him by hobnobbing with the first-class passengers. Ismay trusted Captain Smith, which is why he got the honor of taking the helm of the Olympic, the ship they sent out many times before its identical twin, Titanic. The only reason no one remembers the Olympic is because it didn't sink. But it came close, thanks to Captain Smith. Smith crashed it into another ship, cutting an 8 by 15 foot hole in the Olympic. It had to be towed in. Another time, Smith sailed Olympic over a submerged wreck and a propeller blade tore off. Captain Smith was found guilty of recklessness. That should have ended his career, but instead he got a promotion. Ismay wanted Captain Smith for Titanic's maiden voyage, violating the unwritten rule of never hiring an officer who had been responsible for a previous disaster at sea. When Smith brought Titanic out of the harbor, he almost crashed it into another ship, not to mention that they left port while there was a fire burning in one of the vessel's coal bunkers. Maybe, just maybe, they should have put out the fire before loading up the ship with people, but Smith overlooked that too. Titanic's maiden voyage was underway. The farther Titanic got out into the middle of the ocean, the colder it got. On April 14, 1912, it was so cold that most of the passengers stay bundled up indoors. Titanic received 18 ice-related warnings from other ships as it crossed the North Atlantic. Look out, icebergs ahead. The rock-hard hunk of glacier formed over millions of years had broken off and floated out to sea. Ismay knew about the ice warnings. It would have been a good time to slow down, but Ismay didn't want that and Captain Smith couldn't be bothered. He was busy partying with a bunch of millionaires. So Titanic kept plowing forward at 22 knots, 25.3 miles per hour, the fastest it had gone on the trip and very close to the ship's maximum speed of 23 to 24 knots. Every two hours, the iceberg spotters up in the crow's nest were switched out so they didn't turn into icebergs themselves. Despite their best efforts, at 11.40 p.m. on the night of April 14, 1912, Titanic hit an iceberg. Ten seconds later, there was a 300-foot gash in the side of the ship. Ismay felt something, maybe for the first time in his life. He hopped out of bed to find out what it was. He met with Captain Smith, Titanic's designer, Thomas Andrew, and the chief engineer, Joseph Bell. Smith kept the engines going forward for another 35 minutes because how would it look to the press if he had ha had to have another ship towed in? But that made the ship's damage compartments fill up with seawater even faster. 
Only Ismay and those other three men knew the ship would be at the bottom of the ocean in a couple of hours. But Ismay knew something else. There weren't enough lifeboats on board because he had decided they were ugly to look and took up too much space on the wreck deck. Thanks to Bruce Ismay's decision, there were only enough for 1,100 of the 2,340 passengers and crew on board. Ismay didn't even bother to warn his valet, who had been working for him for 10 years, that the ship was sinking. For his family's former butler, who was now working on the ship, or his personal attendant on the voyage, or his secretary, Ismay's heartlessness was titanic. Ismay's heart told him one thing, get into a lifeboat before they run out of seats. Captain Smith never gave the order to abandon ship or even to inform the passengers that the ship was sinking. He let all the millionaires keep sipping champagne. Guess they weren't really his friends, but pretty soon the ship was clearly listing to one side and going down, so the crew started helping people get off without Smith's orders. Everyone agreed that women and children were to be put in the lifeboats first. But of the 705 people who were saved, out of the 2,340 2, passengers on board, 325 of them were men. And one of them was Bruce Ismay. Ismay knew there were lots of women who didn't have a seat in a lifeboat, and that many of them were locked below decks in the third class area. He later claimed there were no women and children around when he got into the lifeboat. Maybe that is how things looked to a guy who never wanted to help anyone. Ismay wasn't a person who was into saving people or hoisting lifeboats, cutting ropes, or alerting people to danger. Titanic sank. The lucky ones in the lifeboats watched in horror as it disappeared into the drink. Everyone but Bruce Ismay. He looked the other way, like it wasn't happening. I did not wish to see her go down, he said. Ismay also didn't try to save any of the screaming people bobbing in the freezing water, even though there was room in his boat. When the people in the lifeboats were rescued by the Carpathia, a ship that had arrived to help the next morning, Ismay got on board and announced, I'm Ismay, for God's sake, get me something to eat. Get me a stateroom. Meanwhile, the other survivors had to huddle in hallways and comfort each other. Bruce put a sign on the door of his room, please do not knock. First order of business for Ismay was to stop paying any surviving crew members since they were no longer really working, and he started sending radio messages to the White Star in New York using another name, Yamsey, Ismay backwards. He wanted his staff to get him out of New York as soon as he docked because he was getting word that there would be a U.S. Senate hearing on the disaster, and he also knew some place in that iceberg of a heart that he should not have been one of the people who survived. Ismay was going to be a coward once again. He would save himself from public scorn. Others, loved ones, were at the bottom of the Atlantic, but Ismay was the real bottom dweller. Unfortunately, the U.S. Navy picked up the messages Yamsey sent, and they were forwarded to the U.S. Senate. When the Carpathia docked in New York, there were 30,000 people waiting to see who was still alive. The survivors walked down the gangplank, but not Ismay. He stayed locked in his private room. When Ismay didn't come out, two U.S. Senators forced their way into his stateroom and informed him he was to appear the next morning at the Senate's official investigation into the wreck of the Titanic. There was no lifeboat to save Ismay this time. At the hearing, Bruce Ismay was asked questions. Do you know what proportion of women and children were saved? Do you know which officers on the ship died? Do you know how many people were in the lifeboats? Are any of the wireless operators still alive? Did the ship break in two? His answer to all the questions was, I have no idea. I didn't ask. Ismay didn't even care enough to ask. It was the worst shipwreck of all time. It was one on the cover of every newspaper in the world, enough to fill a hundred scrapbooks, but Ismay had nothing to say about it. Bruce got a slap on the wrist and was permitted to go back to England. No one in his family was permitted to mention the disaster or his shameful escape ever again. Ismay's scrapbooks got pretty thin after that, even though he lived another 25 years, but his failure filled many other scrapbooks instead. Bruce Ismay's humanity went down long before the ship. He had already shown the people in his family who he really was. Now the whole world knew. Thanks, guys. Stay tuned for episode 13.